Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, The John Campion Show, coming to you from right here on my YouTube channel. I am, of course, your host, John Campia, and it is an awesome honor and privilege, as it is every day, to have you, our international friends, gather around as we talk about our favorite things in the world, movies, movie news, TV, and streaming, all sorts of good things. And ladies and gentlemen, he's our very own Barbie in this Barbie world. He is the one and the only Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, how are you doing today, sir? That's right, John. I'm securing myself. I don't have to be Ken. I can be Barbie. <laughs> You can be Barbie. Um, hey, guys. Thanks a lot for joining us here today. Of course, yesterday we didn't have a show. I had a mixture of a whole bunch of things I had to do, and then I got hit with some kind of problem with my stomach yesterday, too, so it was just as well. So we didn't have a show yesterday, but I'm so glad you guys are joining us here today. And we do have a lot of things we're going to talk about. Red Notice, the new Dwayne Johnson, Ryan Reynolds film, finally has itself a little bit of a release date. No Marvel or DC at Comic-Con, but does that really even matter? We're going to talk about that thing in a bit, too. Black Widow annihilates the opening night record set by F9. We're going to talk about that and a whole bunch of things more. And here's how today's show is going to go, guys. We're going to break it into two parts. In the first half of the show, we're going to talk about some prearranged topics that we have here today. And then in the second half of the show, we're going to take your live comments and questions. Now, the way you get a live comment or question on this show or an upcoming companion video is to go down to the description of this video and you'll see a tip link. Simply click on that or enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movie blog tv slash tip you'll be getting your comment or question on the show if it's appropriate for the show and of course you'll be supporting the channel at the same time and all of us involved here at the john campus show thank you guys very much for your support and you know what else rob aaron cummings was going to join us today it was going to be you me and aaron for the big trinity th show here today but unfortunately last night Erin, being a working actress as she is, something came up and she wasn't able to join us today, so she sends her regards. But don't worry, she'll be back here later this week, and we'll have her on again a little bit later this week. All right, guys. With all that down and out of the way, let's get things started with an off the top. And that first off the top is this. You know, Rob, a while ago, there was a report. I think I was still at AMC, to be honest with you. When the first reports came out, Again, about uh, I think it was Amy Schumer was going to do a Barbie movie. And while some people kind of rolled their eyes at that, I love the concept they were putting out there because it was going to be about body image and the way all that kind of stuff and that, you know, she obviously did not fit the model of what Barbie was. And I actually thought that sounded kind of interesting, but then mm -hmm. that fell apart. And then sometime later, word came out that Margot Robbie was going to be doing a Barbie movie, which is, let's face it, far more stereotypical. But hey, no one's complaining. Now, it was also announced a while ago that Academy-nominated filmmaker Greta Gerwig, I believe she's one of only seven women in history who've been nominated for Best Director at the Academy Awards. Now, her last two films, Lady Bird and Little Women, have a combined 11 Academy Award nominations. At any rate, she was coming on to write it. But now, according to reports... It's now official. She is also going to be directing the Barbie film starring Margot Robbie. Now, this is interesting because, first of all, I should say, I don't want to be disingenuous here. I thought Lady Bird is maybe the most overrated movie of the last 10 years. Uh, but, <laughs> but I say overrated because everybody else loves it. And I acknowledge everybody else loves it. It got nominated for an Academy Award, which is far more than any film I'll ever make in my lifetime is going to do. She got nominated for Best Director. I believe she got nominated for Best Director for that. I mean, it's an incredible achievement. I just personally didn't like La Lady Bird. I, I found it to be insufferably, be insufferably boring, and I wanted to walk out. But everybody else loves it, and so that's great. And then she did Little Women, which I loved her iteration of Little Women as a matter of fact. So I thought she was really good with that. So it's really interesting that she's going to be bringing that. Now, Rob, when you're talking about an Academy-level filmmaker and now an Academy-nominated actress in the lead, I don't know about you, but for me, I have to admit, it sort of changes my perception about what a Barbie live-action movie could be. Because you know Greta Gerwig isn't going to step in to do some brainless fluff. I mean, I may not have liked Lady Bird that much, but mindless fluff, it was not. So you got to assume if a Greta Gerwig is going to step in and do this, and Margot Robbie, you know, the Academy-nominated actress herself is behind this, 
I have to admit, it makes me pause for a second, sit back and go, I might have to reevaluate what I think this movie might be. So I, at the very minimum, it's an interesting development. Rob, you hear that Greta Gerwig's going to be directing a Barbie movie. What are your thoughts on this? Well, at first, my first thought is, uh, is that what they really should be spending their time on? However, I was more of a fan of Greta Gerwig's Lady Bird than you might have been. And I think, I think most Margo, people were. <laughs> I think Margot Robbie, you know, I think she's a phenomenal actress. I mean, her her portrayal of Tanya Harding and I Tanya was fearless. What she did in Wolf of Wall Street again was incredible. And I know everyone's like, oh, she's Harley Quinn, but she is she is a top drawer actress. Uh, I can see her turning in performances into her nineties. And if she's going to get behind this and Greta Gerwig is going to get behind this, at least I would hope that between the two of them, they're going to come up with something rather unique, a unique take on all of this and probably an encapsulation of what what Barbie means to culture, what it's meant to women over the last, what, 60 years. I mean, John, one of those episodes of The Toys That Made Us is about Barbie, and it's yep. absolutely fascinating. So I'm hoping that we're going to get something. Look, I ain't going to run out and see it opening night if that's what you're asking me. However, I do see that maybe they could come up with something that's innovative and interesting. But you're going to have to convince me. <laughs> yeah. And is it weird to say <laughs> is it weird to say that Margot Robbie may be too good looking to play Barbie? Is that weird? <laughs> Like she might actually be too good looking to play Barbie. I don't know, it's man. My sister had a lot of Barbies and uh, she was hot. Uh, that's true. By the way, our friends Dag, uh, Dag and 10 and uh, Peter Cunnington send in super chat badges in the live chat. Thank you for that, guys. Anyway, the question is for you guys. What do you think about this news? Listen, it's, it's almost like thinking about a Smurfs movie coming out, but then you find out Martin Scorsese is going to be directing it. It changes your perception of what that Smurfs movie might be. Does the addition of Greta Gerwig into the director's chair do that for you for a Barbie movie? What do you guys think? Jump down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With that down, let's do one more off the top, and that is this. You know, Rob, one of the big stories, of course, this last year and a half has obviously been the pandemic. And for those of us in movie circles, how that pandemic has affected the movie industry. And we've been really gratefully been able to see that slowly but surely the recovery of the movie industry and the theatrical industry. We had things like a, the big hit of Quiet Place 2, which did great. Then F9, a movie neither you or I liked, but F9 came out and did fantastic business at the box office, made $70 million opening weekend, blowing away any previous film, the biggest opening since Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker pre-pandemic, and it did great. So we've been anxiously waiting to see how a Black Widow would do. Now, mm. there have been predictions that Black Widow could hit anywhere from 70 to $85 million opening weekend, which would exceed that of F9 and, again, be another great step towards the full recovery of the theatrical industry. There are a few things going against it, of course, not the least of which the fact that Disney is still doing that idiotic uh, premium release thing on Disney Plus where you got to be a Disney Plus member and you got to pay $30 on top of that and you don't even get a theatrical experience. But whatever, you know some people are, and maybe a bunch of people are going to take advantage of that as well. So how big could it be? Well, apparently the answer is pretty big because keep this in mind. The opening night numbers for Fast 9, opening night was $7.1 million in box office opening night. That was a pandemic record. Since the pandemic era started, that was a record for an opening night at the box office. Black Widow was interesting. How is it going to do? Well, now we know. Black Widow came out and almost doubled that amount. They nearly doubled that amount with $13.2 million. Fast 9, which opened to $70 million, came out of the gate with 7.1, a pandemic-era record. Everybody was celebrating, and for sure, it was a terrific result for it. I don't think, Rob, and even the most optimistic of people, and I know you have been very optimistic about how Black Widow could do, but I don't yep. know that even the most optimistic a person would have foresaw that Black Widow would come close to doubling the opening night results 
a fast nine. Now, before anybody gets ahead of themselves, I'm I'm sure right now there are a bunch of people thinking, well, that means this thing's going to make double the box office opening weekend. It's going to make 140 million opening weekend since, you know, Fast Nine did 70 and nearly doubled it. This thing could get close to 140. All this really means is that there was a lot of people anxious to get out and see it on its first available night. It doesn't necessarily mean that sa- that Friday will also have double the numbers, and then Saturday will also have double the numbers, and Sunday will also have double the numbers. You're not going to see Black Widow making 140 million opening weekend. But Rob, you and I had a discussion just a couple of days ago about whether Black Widow could realistically hit that hundred million dollar mark, even though the projections were around 85. They've now adjusted that and said they're projecting 80 to 90 million dollars. And Rob, you and I both said that it had a very good chance, but you went even further. You said it will make a hundred million or more opening weekend. These numbers seem to bode very well for that prediction. Rob, <laughs> you're seeing this makes nearly double that what F9 did on its opening night. A- an absolutely spectacular result. What's your evaluation of this? And how does this alter your perception about the chances Black Widow has of actually cracking a hundred million dollars opening weekend? Well, you know, to me, it's it's kind of, I, I to be honest, it's kind of what I expected. And I think, you know, people haven't seen a big Marvel movie in a long time, uh, coupled with the fact that, you know, a lot of people under uh, underestimated Captain Marvel, which made over a billion dollars. And I said, look, the simple fact that you've got a movie that moms and daughters can go see together, and that is something that isn't normally taken into consideration with big budget genre films. And there's the element of family in this as well that has been uh, all the reviews and the people that have written articles about this movie have come down on heavily. And the sisterly bonds between Yelena and Natasha here. I think that the female audience is always underestimated for movies like this. And that's why, you know, I think that it's it's kind of what I expected. We'll see. It really comes down to how do people like the movie? And I've read a lot of, you know, there's been, of course, a lot of pundits in our space who've talked about, oh, it's not so good. But I haven't seen a lot of female pundits say that. And I think that sometimes we as men might miss uh, when you have films that's uh, films like this that uh, that is about female bonding and, and two women working together to kick some ass that we underestimate how important this is to our, uh, our, our the sisters that live on this planet that uh, love this kind of stuff and uh, and are an underserved audience. So I stand by my prediction, John. I want to go. I want to believe it's going to make a hundred million, but that's only if the audience digs it. But I'm sticking by it. Sticking by it. Well, in asking the question about how does the audience dig it, it's not just the female audience. Like as of right now, this thing is still holding over eighty percent on Rotten Tomatoes. But now that audiences have actually starting to see it. Remember Rotten Tomatoes now has verified user ratings, meaning only people who can verify that they bought a ticket to see the movie through Fandango can register a vote. So it prevents review bombing, or at least to, to a big degree re- prevents review bi- bombing. And look at this. Black Widow's got an 81% critic rating, but it's currently holding a 94% audience rating. 94%. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who saw it thinks it's a 9 out of 10 movie, but it means at least 94% of the audience is saying, we like this movie. I mean, that's that's huge because I like Black Widow. You know, I did my review for Black Widow. I like this movie. I don't think it's top shelf MCU, but it's, it's a solid movie. David Harbour was absolutely fantastic in it. I thought he was great. The family dynamics I thought really good. I thought the villain was a letdown, but overall it was a solid movie. But I didn't expect the audience score to be that high. I was expecting like 70 to 75%, which still would be great. That would still be very good. But the thing is holding an 81% and a 94% audience. I mean, so apparently the word of mouth on this thing is going to be strong. Rob, let me let me ask you this now, just to put the, the fire to your feet a little bit. I'm going to set a number here, an over-under number. Over or under, Black Widow will make $112 million opening weekend. Over or under that? That's a tough one, right? <laughs> I'm gonna go under. Look, I've already I've already set my bar high enough. I I, <laughs> I I I can't I can't go further. I can't go I can't go more, John. I I, I listen. I 
I was before thinking this movie's got a shot at a hundred million dollars. I think I set it at like forty percent or something like that. I'm now going to go over fifty percent. That's going to make, but I would also take under one hundred and twelve. I don't think it's going to make one hundred twelve. But oh my god, the fact that this thing could make a hundred million dollars, even if it doesn't, I mean, even if this thing hits like ninety, ninety-five million dollars, it's impressive. The question is for you guys: What do you think? About these numbers for Black Widow, I mean, Fast 9 set the record. It was great bringing people back into the theaters for opening night with like $7.1 million for its opening night. Black Widow almost doubles it at 13.2. What do you guys think and how big do you think the overall opening weekend for this film can be? Whatever you guys think, jump on down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, with that down and out of the way, Let's move on to our main topics today here, shall we? And how do we select our main topics here on the John Campus Show? Well, it's really rather simple. You see, you guys come up with our main topics. Whenever you come across a big topic, issue, or story that you think we need to cover as a main topic here on the show, just go anytime 24-7 over to www.thejohncampiashow.com slash contact. Once you get there, you're going to see a form. Fill it out with your topic or question. It's absolutely free. Hit submit, and then maybe... Just maybe you might see your submission featured as a main topic here on the John Campia show. With that down, Rob, what is our first main topic today? Well, John, the first topic comes to us from Austin Farley. Hey, John and crew. I was wondering if you saw the news that Amazon has greenlit a sequel to the Tomorrow War. I was pretty surprised to see this considering it had Little marketing and virtually no buzz leading up to the release. What are your thoughts? Well, John, uh, the numbers don't lie. This movie is the number one movie on Amazon. Apparently for them, it's a huge hit as far as viewership is concerned. And to me, I'm like, well, that's kind of academic. Of course they want, of course they want another one because, hey, with, with, with their viewing numbers, and they, they know this like over – it's very funny. Like we talk about opening weekends for movies at the box office. But for streaming services, they're getting real-time data, uh, and they can look at it and see exactly how many people that use their system, that use Amazon Video, are watching something immediately. So for them, they're like, well, this is our number one movie, maybe ever. I don't know if that's true, but it was big, big, real big for Amazon. So to me, it's academic. I mean, obviously, they're, they're very happy with the results. So it's a, for them, it was a no-brainer. And look, did I love the movie? I watched it. It was fine. You know, I didn't think it was a pastiche of about five different movies I could throw out uh, right away. Even a little bit of A Quiet Place was in it. But I, you know, if, if, if I hadn't seen all those other movies and watched it in like 1984, I'm like, this is pretty cool. You know, I would have thought about it in the same way I thought about Tremors, I guess. But um Cinema Blend says the creative team that brought the action movie about an apocalyptic alien war is apparently involved in continuing with the Tomorrow War 2 per deadline. It has not yet been confirmed by the studio or those involved, but reportedly director Chris McKay, writer Zach Dean, along with the main cast, including Chris Pratt, Yvonne Strahovski, uh, Be- who I love, by the way, Betty Gilpin, Edwin Hodge, Sam Richardson and J.K. Simmons could be involved in continuing the franchise. I, you know, for me, dude. No brainer. I'm happy for everybody that's involved. And uh, why not? Maybe it'll be maybe it'll be the Empire Strikes Back of the Tomorrow War franchise. What do you think? You know, listen, I, I got to say, I was pleasantly surprised by the movie because, you know, we talked about the fact leading up in the days leading up to it being released. The fact that Amazon was basically hiding this film. They weren't letting right. reviews come out for it, all that kind of stuff. There, there wasn't a tremendous amount of marketing for it. I mean, and it did well. It, I, I think ultimately said 2.1 million households watched it, which is great. I mean, if you if you try to equate that to box office dollars, it wouldn't be all that wonderful. I mean, 2.1 million dollar, 2.1 million people seeing a movie at the average of ten dollars a movie ticket means it would have made like 21 million bucks. But still. 2.1 million on streaming is actually pretty solid. And listen, it was a better movie than I thought it was going to be. And who was the director there? Chris McKay, yeah. the director, who of course did the the Lego Batman movie, which I absolutely love. And he was supposed to do a night a live action Nightwing movie for Warner Brothers, and then that kind of got kerfuffled. He still hopes that can happen. And by the way, he's directing the upcoming Johnny Quest film. Uh, which I think is going to be really interesting to see how he does with the Johnny Quest. I think that's going to be really cool. But I'll tell you what, 
I watched this film expecting the worst, and I was pleasantly surprised. Chris Pratt was great. J.K. Simmons was awesome in it. I mean, J.K. Simmons yeah. was absolutely incredible in it. I thought the aliens were vicious looking and scary. Uh, there was a little bit of Starship Troopers in there. There, yep, <laughs> there was. There was a bit of Starship Troopers in there, but that was okay, and that was fine. I liked the ending of the film. like the, Not just the end end, but like the last bit of sequence that they had to do. I thought that was pretty damn good. And so, listen, if they look, I, does this need a sequel? No, it doesn't need to have a sequel. But then again, no movie in history needed a sequel. So I'm not terribly surprised with the success they're having. And I'll tell you what, I'm down for it. I'll watch this thing. I thought Pratt did a good job carrying it. I would miss Yvonne Strahovski unless they figure out a way to bring her back into the next one. But Overall, I, I think this is good news, and I'll look forward to watching it. And by the way, our friend Marie Seifring sends in a Super Chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Marie. Appreciate that. Anyway, guys, the question is for you. What do you think about this? What did you think about The Tomorrow War if you saw it? And also, are you excited about the idea of a sequel? Do you think maybe this is one they should just pass by? I'm going to say I'm leaning towards looking forward to the sequel. What do you guys think? Jump down into the comments section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, with that down, let's move on to main topic number two. And our second main topic today gets submitted to us by Vic B. And Vic B. writes, Greetings and salutations. There hasn't been a lot of talk about the new Netflix movie Red Notice with arguable, probably meant arguably, three of the biggest movie stars in the world. Uh, starring in it with Dwayne Johnson, Ryan Reynolds, and Gal Gadot. Uh, just saw on Twitter that they finally have a release date for it on November 12th. Wanted to ask where your excitement level is for this one uh, is now that we have a release date. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, man. I, I don't know that I'd say it's three of the biggest movie stars in the world. I mean, Dwayne Johnson and Ryan Reynolds, yes. Um, Gal Gadot, I think, I don't know if anybody can name three movies she's been in. Uh, that don't have the words Wonder Woman in it. But I mean, but she's certainly popular. Ryan Reynolds is one of my favorite actors in the world right now. Dwayne Johnson is one of my favorite guys in movies to see. Their chemistry together for the little bit that they have together in Hobbs and Shaw, I thought was fantastic. I really did. Add in somebody like a gal on this too. It certainly gives the film a lot of star power. We finally do have a release date for November 12th. This comes to us from the folks over at Deadline who write, finally, in the best rock voice, finally, we have a, a drop date for Netflix's mega action, uh, Ross and Marshall Thurber, which, Rob, I know you have some thoughts on, uh, directed feature Red Notice, and it's November 12th, around the world. Dwayne Johnson just made the news official across the social media. In the movie, an Interpol-issued red notice goes out. That's a global alert to hunt and capture the world's most wanted. Johnson stars as the FBI's top profiler, so basically his name is going to be Hobbs in this, uh, and Wonder Woman's Gal Gadot and Deadpool's Ryan Reynolds as two rival criminals who are all brought together for a daring heist. Dun, dun, dun. And hey, listen, I'll tell you what. I think the synopsis sounds pretty interesting. I mean, yeah, okay. Dwayne Johnson's playing a government agent who's going to hot, hot hunt down the big, hot, sexy criminals. Okay, sure, we've seen that before. But all right, still, it's a Dwayne Johnson thing. The synopsis actually sounds pretty good. I have a hard time getting terribly excited for this, despite the fact that it's got Dwayne Johnson and despite the fact that it's got one of my favorite guys in the business in the world right now in Ryan Reynolds. And Rob, you know why? It's a Netflix movie. Right. And listen, I allowed myself to get all excited for another Ryan Reynolds Netflix live action thing called Six Underground. I thought the trailers looked great. It's Ryan Reynolds. The action looked insane. Michael Bay was directing it, which meant that even if everything else went wrong, you knew the action was going to be great. And But I should have known. It's a Netflix movie. And so I watched Six Underground, and I was like, of course, Ryan Reynolds did everything he could to carry that damn thing. But at the end of the day, it was just... Eh, eh. And I find nine times out of ten, you know, one time out of ten... Netflix knocks it out of the park. They do. But nine times out of 10, it ends up being disappointing. And I have to admit that until I start really seeing some tangible footage, it's going to be difficult for me to get terribly excited about this, Rob. I, I, I just, 
I just can't knowing it's a Netflix film. But I know, Rob, listen, I think the synopsis sounds great. Three super charismatic, big, beautiful, sexy movie stars in this thing. They've been working on this. Dwayne Johnson's obviously taking it very seriously. We've got a release date now for November. Where's your excitement level for Red Notice right now? Well, look, the idea of a great international espionage action thriller is always something that'll be on my radar. You know, just because I've loved those movies since I was a kid. And with this cast, I mean, it's something I couldn't look away from. But like you said, it's a Netflix movie. And I still haven't figured out why is it like even a, something like the old guard that I enjoyed. I loved old but guard. It's, it still wasn't, I, it was good, but it still wasn't genius. There's, it's just missing. And like, what was the Ben Affleck movie with the guys searching for the money that go to rip off, you know, that, um, uh, with like in South America, uh, that movie too. I, I liked it, but I didn't love it. And I'm hoping, cause I hope, you know, I hope Springs Eternal, John, I'm hoping this movie's great because with this cast and it looks good, I just don't know about Ross and Marshall Thurber as a director. Right. You know, he he seems just a tad lowbrow, you know, in terms of and I which is fine, populist filmmaker, it's it's cool. But I think one of the things about these kinds of movies is there does need to be a certain element of intellect that elevates the material. You know, and 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 I I I mean, yeah, that might seem silly to expect something like that from this, mm. but I'm hoping, I'm hoping, John, make it good. I hope it's good. Well, I'll tell you what, if good looks equaled box office and this thing was in theaters, it would make three or four billion dollars worldwide because you got like three of the best looking people in movies right now. Question is for you guys. What do you think about this? We now have a release date for Red Notice coming out November 12th. Are you looking forward to this film? Whatever you guys are thinking about it, jump on down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With that down, let's move on to main topic number three. Rob, what is our third main topic today? Well, speaking of international spies, the one and only says... Hi, John, Rob, and Aaron. Deadline reported Matthew Vaughn, Kingsman's all new, uh, new movie, all-star cast for the spy franchise to be Argyle. With John's sweetheart, Henry Cavill, Sam Rockwell, Bryce Dallas Howard, Brian Cranston, Catherine O'Hara, John Cena, Samuel L. Jackson, and Dua Lipa's acting debut, Argyle aims to reinvent the spy genre. With shooting beginning this August, what can we expect from this new franchise and how excited are you to see Henry Cavill on a spy role again? Have a great weekend. Well, again, dude, I look at this cast. I know that it's Matthew Vaughn directing and I, I was a big fan of the first Kingsman. I, I think the new one looks pretty good. Uh, the Golden Cir Golden Circle was a little disappointing to me, but I, I love Matthew Vaughn. I mean, I still go back to his first feature as a director, Lair Cake that he was a producer, but then he moved over to, to directing. I loved Lair Cake. And this cast, man, I loved Henry Cavill as a spy in The Man from U.N.C.L.E. So good. You know, boy, did he cut a, a, a great figure in, cut in that suit of his. And then the rest of this cast, Sam Rockwell, Brian Cranston, Catherine O'Hara, what a Sam Jackson. I mean, this cast is, is kind of epic, really. And again, I, I think Matthew Vaughn's style, I, I mean, look, if it's, is it going to be over the top like Kingsman? Or is he going to pull it back and make it more like a Jean Le Carré story? Probably not. But like Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. But still, I mean, again, John, uh, you, internet, you had me at Spies. And uh, I'm in. And this comes from coming soon. The film adaptation will center around the world's greatest spy, Argyle, as he is caught up in a globe-trotting adventure. Marv is looking to develop this project into becoming the first of at least three films in the potential big franchise that will be set throughout multiple locations across the world, including America and London. Because, by the way, John, every spy movie has to have London as a setting. It's just like, <laughs> it's, it's important. When I read this, incre uh, this early draft manuscript, I felt it was the most incredible and original spy franchise since Ian Fleming's books of the 50s, Matthew Vaughn said in a statement via deadline. This is going to reinvent the spy genre. Now, I'm not going to say that's hyperbole, John. 
but it sounds like hyperbole to me. But still, <laughs> again, man, I'm in. What do you think? Are you in? Dude, listen. Uh, first of all, you got you got my my bromance partner in Henry Cavill. <laughs> I in know, there, right? That he's he's my ultimate bromance dude. I love Henry Cavill. Obviously, so glad you mentioned him in Man from Uncle. I loved him in Man from Uncle. Me too. It's the role that convinced me he should be our next Jane. I mean, I'm open to whoever they want to put in the role, but I would, you know, Henry Cavill was the runner up to play James Bond. Uh, that eventually went to our current James Bond. If if it wasn't going to be him, we would have Henry Cavill as James Bond right now. So I I think he should be next in line to play Bond. But whatever. Now we're going into Argyle. I love hearing Matthew Vaughn getting excited about the manuscript that he read about the the, the novel. This is going to be based on a new novel coming out called Argyle. And Rob, listen, when you talk about Matthew Vaughn, Lair Cake, great. But he also did what I consider to be the maybe the most underrated movie ever made in Stardust. I love Stardust. You guys hear me talk about that movie all the time. It is imaginative and creative and delightful and just fantastic. It is the modern day Princess Bride. I love Stardust. And then he did Kick-Ass. And then he did X-Men First Class. And then he did the first Kingsman. Now, yeah, then he did Kingsman 2 and... Okay, that okay. Fine. So everybody's got to have a bad day at the office, but I love that. And Rob, you start running down this cast. I mean, dear heavens, look at this cast. This is fantastic. I mean, everybody. I mean, obviously, I got a few question marks about John Cena being in there, but you know, when John Cena's in a supporting role, he can be dynamite. I still have big apprehensions about him as a leading guy, but he has shown several times when he's in a good supporting role, John Cena can bring it. I'm obviously a little bit wondering, okay, Dua Lipa, they're putting her in there because she's super hot and she's famous. I'm not expecting an Oscar performance out of her, but whatever. Look at the rest of them. Brian Cranston, Sam Rockwell, Henry Cavill, Dallas Bryce, Howard. What? <laughs> I mean, this is amazing. In a super spy genre, Rob, there's nothing about this to me that should not be excitement inducing. There's nothing I, about this that shouldn't be excitement. Like I, I'm looking. I mean, okay, little question: Why do you got to put in a pop star? Do and I, I got nothing bad to say about Dua Lipa. I'm just saying, why do you got to throw her in there? But whatever. I guess they want to put some butts in the seats, and that's fine. But you're running down this. I, I mean, this is just incredible. And of course, Catherine O'Hara. I mean, royalty. You, you, you put royalty in there as well. So. I love everything about this. Obviously, I have not read the book, so I can't say anything for sure. But if Matthew Vaughn is this excited, and he's obviously been able to assemble an incredible cast, I it's I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say, Rob, it may be now be in my top five most anticipated movies, period. Not mm -hmm. just of this year. Twenty. I mean, it, I think this is now in my top five most anticipated most anticipated movies. Period. End stop. I, I mean, this sounds incredible to me. Anyway, guys, the question is for you. What do you think about the sounds of our guy? You got Matthew Vaughn in there, Henry Cavill, Sam Rockwell, Brian Cranston, Catherine. I mean, what? This this is insane, guys. How do you feel about this? Jump on down into the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys, with that down and out of the way, let's move on to main topic number four. And our fourth main topic today gets submitted to us by Armand Harris, who writes, Hey, John and crew. So I just read some really disappointing news that both Marvel and DC will not be having any presence at the upcoming Comic-Con. Does this mark the end of the big comic book movies doing presentations at Comic-Con? What are your thoughts? All right. Thanks a lot for sending that in, man. And yes, in the, in the last day or so, news came out. Of course, Comic-Con at home is coming up. I'm not going to lie to you. I completely forgot it was coming. I totally forgot it was coming. And I couldn't even tell you right now. I think it's coming up in the next couple of weeks. I totally forgot about this until this news came out that both Marvel and DC were bypassing it. Now, last year, obviously, Comic-Con couldn't happen. So they did their virtual thing. It did not have great success as a virtual event. And so I think a lot of people, including myself, who am a big fan of Comic-Con, I love San Diego Comic-Con, but 
you know, I look forward to it because I can physically be there. To be around 100, 200,000 other fans who have been looking forward to this all year, going there, sharing their joy and excitement of the content they love, whether it's comic books or or movies or TV shows, whatever. Everybody's like cosplaying and having a good time, high-fiving each other in streets. It's honestly... It, it, Rob, I, I say it's good for the soul. I love going to Comic-Con every year because it feeds my soul. Being around that many people who are that happy and having that good of a time, it's amazing. And it is the identity of Comic-Con. It's the identity of Comic-Con. Yeah. A virtual thing is not going to be the same. And so not many people paid attention to it last year. Not many people have been paying attention to the fact that it's coming up this year. And so to hear that Marvel Studios and DC... We're both going to be skipping it. It it caused some stir, but really to me, it's like, yeah, I'm not surprised. It's a virtual event that last year not many people were all that excited about. I think Marvel and DC, I mean, DC obviously has DC fandom. If you're going to do a virtual thing, they're going to have a lot more success with their virtual event anyway. But I don't think this at all, Robin, and maybe you disagree with me on this. But I don't think this says anything about the real Comic-Con in and of itself. Now, it's unfortunate that they still weren't quite able to do it live this year. They're going to do some kind of live event in November, which I will go to, even though I have no idea what they're going to have at. It's not going to be the full-blown Comic-Con, but at least it's going to be something live and in person. Sure. But Rob, even the last Comic-Con, the last live Comic-Con we had, Kevin Feige made big splashes and big waves at that thing he brought out you know jane came out natalie portman came out taika watiti got down on his knee and presented mjolnir to natalie portman you know we had mahershala ali and we you know it's just they made a big deal and they made big splashes and that was at the last comic-con i rob right now listen it's a long ways off who knows but when comic-con happens again the real comic-con I believe you will see Marvel return. And I believe you'll see, especially now that it's going to be under new leadership with Discovery, I think you'll see the DC return to it as well. You can still do your virtual events like DC Fandom, which they had great success with last year. You can still do that and be a part of the biggest pop cultural event in the world, which is, of course, San Diego Comic-Con. So, I yeah, is it disappointing to hear Marvel and DC won't be a part of this thing? Sure, but I wasn't planning on being a part of it anyway. And it's not really surprising. It's only a virtual event. I think next summer, when Comic-Con returns in full force, I think at minimum you will see Kevin Feige return and bring a lot of good stuff with him. And I actually think you'll see DC return as well. So I don't really think it means anything. But Rob, you hear this. It It's a little bit of a shocking headline when you see Marvel and DC skipping Comic-Con. What do you think the overall meaning of this is? Are you surprised? Are you not surprised? What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, they are supposed to be having an in-person Comic Con. What in October? No, or November. 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 So uh, to a degree, to a degree. Uh, yeah, to a degree. And I, I, I mean, this this makes sense to me in the sense that, uh, you know, having these virtual events, they haven't been doing well. You know, Comic Con last year, the virtual Comic Con was not a big smash success. And there's been a lot of other events like the DC Fandom event that has done better and attracted more viewers. So I can understand, I don't think, you know, going, if people, like I was there when Tom Hiddleston came out in Hall H dressed as Loki. (laughs) And I mean, it was like being at a rock concert. It was insane. And when they announced the Age of Ultron trailer, I or the the name Age of Ultron at that same, at the very end of, I was weeping because I love Ultron. Uh, And it, it, it doesn't, if you can't do that, if, if Kevin Feige can't, hand over Mjolnir to Natalie Portman live with the screaming, almost 7,000 screaming fans, it's not really the same thing. It doesn't have the same impact on social media. You don't have people sharing videos. It, it, I can get, I understand. I totally get it. And now we live in a world where you've got to make your biggest splash, your biggest impact wherever you can. And I, I can see that decision, um, being made. I mean, it's unfortunate because you know, the fans want these things, but I don't think anyone wants virtual Comic-Con anyway. It's just, it feels, if you can't do Comic-Con, don't do Comic-Con. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, but, that, you know, I, I don't know if that's right, but that's kind of how I feel. 
as someone who's been going to Comic Con for three decades, it bums me out when I can't go to Comic Con. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see how this kind of evolves. Question is for you guys. What do you think about Marvel and DC skipping the virtual Comic-Con this year? Do you think that actually has any bearing on what will happen when the live events come back? I personally don't think so. But anyway, what do you guys think? Jump down to the comment section below and let us know your thoughts. Okay, guys. With all that down and out of the way, let's now spend the remainder of our day together talking about the things you want to discuss by taking your live comments and questions. Once again, if you want to find fire in a live comment or question to be read on the show or in an upcoming companion video, simply click on the link that's down in the description of this video, or you could enter it in manually at www.streamelements.com slash movieblogtv slash tip. You'll begin your comment or question read on a show if it's appropriate for our shows. And of course, you'll be supporting our channel at the same time and all of us involved here at the John Campia Show thank you guys so much for your support okay let's get now into it we're going to start things off here with kaiser or kels kelsire who writes i'm not sure how to pronounce that give me wes anderson directing paddington three or give me death i'm gonna say no to that wes anderson's a terrific director he is yeah but knowing the paddington movies is wes anderson the right fit for that I don't think so. But I mean, hey, listen, if they did it, I mean, I'd give it a shot, obviously, but I don't think he's the right fit for that. But eh, whatever, that's just me. All right. An anonymous viewer writes, hey, John, first time writing in. Thank you for writing in, man. And just had to mention uh, a movie. My girlfriend, Emmy, showed me a movie called Mazes. Oh, my God. Mazes and Monsters. A movie about Dungeons and Dragons starring Anne's favorite, Tom Hanks. Tell me you've heard of this movie. Oh, Rob, we've talked about this movie many times. This, For those of you who don't know, Mazes and Monsters, I believe it was a made-for-TV movie. Yes, it was. And it was with a very young Tom Hanks. And basically, the moral of the movie was warning people about the evils and the harm that kids playing this devil game, Dungeons and Dragons. And Rob, you'll never forget that last scene of... I can't remember the exact words, but Tom Hanks standing there on a bridge. Oh, God, what am I doing? Oh, oh, like, hey, parents, if your kids play Dungeons and Dragons, they're all going to throw themselves off bridges. Oh, my God. Everybody remembers Mazes and Monsters. All it did for me when I was a little kid and I saw that just made me want to play Dungeons and Dragons even more. Of course, they couldn't call it Dungeons and Dragons in, in their movie because that would violate copyright. So they, they had to call it Mazes and Monsters. But uh, yeah, everybody today still laughs about that so hard. Rob, did you ever see Mazes and Monsters? And what are your memories of that? Oh, dude, I did. And, you know, back then it was like a big deal. And it, it also the, the idea that Dungeons and Dragons is satanic. It will lead you children down the primrose path and your, <laughs> your lives will be engulfed by evil i mean people actually thought that kind of like the pmrc was like this heavy metal music is dangerous uh, I, and that's kind of where that whole that whole tv movie was coming from it was a cautionary tale and i thought come on man <laughs> really <laughs> ah, i mean it, was like, it was like a geek after school special instead of being about like bulimia or anorexia or drugs it was like the dangers of role playing yeah and of so course, like, I play. I I still play D and D to this day, and I turned out okay. Right. Well, that's up for well, debate. Yeah, you're, how do we know you're not you're not possessed by Satan, John? We don't. Mephisto. Every Rob. time you play Mephisto. Dungeons and Dragons, Morgoth or whatever you want to call him, has come up to take your soul away. A new pentagram in, appears. I, the only reason I don't take my shirt off right now is because every time I play D and D, a pentagram appears on my chest. I've got why. Well, I, yeah, I never of thought them. like like okay, so medieval medieval fantasy. How does that equate to the devil? I, I like, don't know. You know. I don't know. Rob, I remember, listen, most people, I, I, I'm i not trying to start up a discussion here, but the, the because I know a lot of people who are within like the Christian church and things like that, and most of them are completely sane, wonderful people. But within every group of people, you know, you'll always have a segment that are kind of nutbags. And there are, there was this Christian um, kids show and I knew the, the producers of it, but there was this Christian kids animated show that was very, very popular. It was called Veggie Tales. And I don't know if any of you guys in the live chat remember Veggie Tales. I still, so it was a bunch of like a fruit and a cucumber and a tomato. And they, they would tell these basically reenact modern versions of Bible stories and things like that. But I still remember, it was delightful. It was a delightful little kids animation, Veggie Tales. I even remember the song for the damn thing. Anyway, Veggie Tales. Anyway. 
But there was even then a group within the church that was like, the, the whole thing about animals or, or inanimate objects like fruits and vegetables having souls and personalities and talking, that comes from the deep satanic idea of whatever. I'm like, dude, you're trying to blast veggie tails? God, I mean, for fuck's sake, you're trying to blast veggie tails? Anyway, there's that. It's always going to be there. So you, you can imagine how nutty they went with Dungeons and Dragons. Okay, anyway, and I love playing D&D. All right, next up. We've got uh, Ben Rayner who writes, Hey, John, I agree with Rob about Hugh, just a tribute. I have no idea what that means. Hey, John, I agree with Rob about Hugh, just a tribute, but hear me out. Ryan posted Deadpool at a mask. Let me try this one more about, time, Ben. About Hugh, 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 Hugh Jackman posting on Instagram. Oh, uh, being Jay just Richard a Donald tribute. Died. Okay. Hey, John, right. I agree with Rob about Hugh Jackman just paying tribute to Richard Donner. But hear me out. Ryan posted Deadpool at a mask. Probably mean in a mask. Guys, please proofread. Uh, at, air, at, at airport. And now this, I suspect, a quick flash cameo type of style in No Way Home. Real quick blink if you miss it cameo in Speed Force like segment. Oh, man, Raven, I'm having a hard time following you today. But usually your things are so well laid out. Uh, part two in No Way Home. I doubt this is the case, but I just have to throw out the chance. Over under 5%. This happens quick, quick cameo. Hugh and Ryan in No Way Home. I know not likely just asking bring on the filthy. So could we be seeing a cameo of Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman in Spider-Man No Way Home? Well, listen, a quick throwaway cameo where they're just stand like... Are you saying that they're actually Wolverine and Deadpool? Zero. That, oh, look, two guys ordering coffee at the counter in the same coffee shop where MJ and Peter are talking is happens to be Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman? That could happen because that could just take, you know, half a day of the guys to fly down there, walk in for one scene, walk out. I mean, that could happen, but honestly, I, I don't think so. Rob, what do you think? I don't think so either. I mean, hey, would it be cool? Sure, but I don't think so. All right, next up, we've got Casey McNatt who writes, I agree with you 100% in your comments on Stephen Dorff, and I will not go, go into the whole Stephen Dorff thing again. Uh, <laughs> this, guy must on, have not, not? You know, this guy must have not remembered that he was actually in a comic book movie. It's the only thing people know. really know him for, and I can't even remember the last movie I've actually seen him in. He isn't well-known, and he's starring in a Uva Bowl film. A good LOL. I know, I know, I know, right? I just, I'm reading the, I just remember reading the comments from that guy saying, I'm embarrassed for people who are in comic book movies. I'll wait to be in the good shit. Dude, you starred in an Uva Bowl movie. You <laughs> have no right to say one freaking word about, I only do quality. So I guess those embarrassments like Sir Anthony Hopkins and Sir Ben Kingsley and Robert Redford and all the, I suppose you're just embarrassed for those guys too, right? They're so far below you. Anyway, I said, I'm not going to get into it again and I won't, but thank you, Casey. Uh, all right, next up. Uh, Tom writes, did Hugh Jackman not say that he would come back as Wolverine if Feige asked him? Or was that the Russos uh, really rings a bell in my mind? I, If I remember correctly, and I may not, Rob, I think that was something that went around but wasn't actually what Hugh Jackman said. I think he's, I think if, if I remember right, and this is years ago now, but he said something along the lines like, if they had asked at a certain point, point in time he would have done it but i think he's just well beyond it now he's 52 turning 53 years old now kevin feige is going to create his own version of the x-men he's not going to be bringing over old x-men characters and hugh jackman has stated emphatically that he is done with the types of workouts that he had to do uh, all the time to stay in wolverine kinds of shapes shape so I, I i still to this day don't think we're it's I mean, anything's possible, but I don't see it happening. Rob, what do you think? Uh, maybe. Maybe. I mean, I never want to say no in this day and age, John. So can I say maybe? maybe you can say happen. maybe. I'd say it's a, I, I think it's a big stretch. But yeah, you can say maybe. All right. Uh, but uh, yeah, look, I tend to agree with you, but 
uh, you know, with what happens, the news we get every day, they're going to revive Silverhawks, I read today. Yeah. You, you know, like, <laughs> really? I remember that toy line. I think there was a comic book, but, but really, who actually in one executive suite goes, yeah, you know what, Silverhawks, it needs a reboot. Hey, really? so, so somebody, maybe somebody went to them with a great idea and gave them a pitch. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> All right. Next up, we got Spider Strange Iron Boy. <laughs> I like that name, writes one of two. Hey, John, if you have a closer look at the Spider-Man No Way Home pop toy, it isn't an arc reactor on his chest. It's a Doctor Strange sorcerer. It's it's Doctor Strange slash sorcerer powers with the same symbols that we've seen sorcerers use. I think he will be an understudy to Doctor Strange now, unfortunately. I get that Marvel have to produce more merchandise, i.e., a uh, three quarters new suits every spider-man film but i do miss the old simplicity of the sam raimi spider-man with the classic suit and his powers were enough not needed to sponge off other heroes and you know what i noticed that myself rob you and i were talking about those toy images and i we first thought because this picture was small and we thought is that an arc reactor on spider-man's chest yeah yeah remember that but then upon closer look you're right it is a sorcerer's kind of thing and he has the sorcerer things on his hand so oh so he was Iron Man Jr. Now he's going to be Doctor Strange Jr.? I, I mean, listen, I'm not going to get too worked up or too worried about something that comes out in toy uh, releases. I'm not going to worry about it till we actually start seeing some things. I will say I do hope they resist the temptation that, again, Spider-Man's not cool enough. Spider-Man's not a good enough character. The only way he can work is if you saddle him up with a real cool character like an Iron Man or a Doctor Strange. I'm not saying that's what they're doing. I'm just saying I hope they avoid that. But, Rob, once you notice that it was like a sorcerer's kind of thing popping up, are you worried that they're going to make him a Doctor Strange Jr. at this point, or are you not worried about that yet? Well, I mean, I don't know about that, although that's a distinct possibility. What I was thinking that there may be, like, maybe at some point, if Doctor Strange is incapacitated, uh, maybe maybe Spider-Man has to wield the eye of Agamotto, maybe. Or something like that. I mean, I don't know. But um, I think, look, it, I do find the idea of Spider-Man wielding mystic energies. I, I could see the joke. Like he tries to he tries to wield mystic energies by whipping out a, a, a web and it doesn't work. And like he has to figure <laughs> out like how to use his hands in the right way. Or like I need to do jazz hands to cast a spell. Not, I don't know. It could be funny. But I hope it's not entirely that i hope it's only like one specific scene like you know maybe strange is down for the count spider-man has to do something i don't know all right next up we've got uh, bk dan writes john i seem to recall that at one point you used to accept write-ins from super chats through youtube yes i was wondering why you changed and went to tips only i had to get a paypal account just to tip damn it seriously longtime fan bring on the filthy for many years all right so yes uh, it used to be on the john campus show like when when youtube created that that super chat feature uh that used to be how we would take live comments and questions from the audience we don't do that any longer for the John Campia show for two reasons, two very important reasons. Reason number one, YouTube keeps 30% of any super chats that get sent in. So if you were to say to super chat in $10, only seven of those dollars actually goes towards supporting the John Campia show. YouTube keeps three of those dollars. Whereas with uh, using stream elements and PayPal, they keep 7%. Anyway, it's a much smaller percentage. It's a much smaller percentage that they keep. So, you know, at, I mean, that may not sound like month much, but like at the end of the month, if like $2,000 of tips came in, YouTube would have kept $600 of that. That's significant. That's really significant. So we went with PayPal. But then the second reason that we did that is because we started to do other shows outside of the John Campia show. So we had play and chats. We have the spoiler discussions. We have the pregame shows and we needed to have a way to keep the questions separate. So when you sent in a question for the John Campia show, it didn't accidentally get read in a WandaVision spoiler discussion. 
that if you sent in a Loki spoiler discussion comment, it didn't accidentally get mixed in with a question for the John Campia show. So what we started to do was a system where for our pregame shows, play in chats, spoiler discussions, all that kind of stuff, we only use super chats so that way we can keep all the questions organized. And then for the John Campia show, we only use the tip link. That way we're able to keep the questions properly separated so we know which question was being asked for what. And of course, you know, for the John Campia show, it meant that YouTube was not keeping 30% of the, the finances that were coming in. So those are the reasons that we do it that way. I hope that makes that clear. And if you have any more questions about that, feel free to ask. All right. Thanks a lot for that, BK. Next up, um, Stubble McShave writes, over under 8% that Hugh Jackman is Reed Richards. I am not gonna, I'm not lying about this, Rob. Not lying about this. A buddy of mine and I had a conversation about that very same thing. That, remember, just because I don't believe Hugh Jackman is coming back to the MCU as Wolverine, that right. doesn't mean he can't come back, come to the MCU. Chris Evans was in the Fantastic Four, but they were still able to bring him into the MCU. No problem. No problem at all. And it's looking more and more like the fan casting of John Krasinski and Emily Blunt as, you know, Reed and Sue Richards isn't going to happen. But a Hugh Jackman as Reed Richards genius by the way brilliant brilliant i would be all over that now you're asking over under eight percent i will say over eight although i still believe it's a fairly small chance i, I would probably set it around 15 percent, so still pretty low but i'll take over eight rob what would you think of the idea of a hugh jackman as reed richards uh hello gorgeous i'm in <laughs> uh I, I i what a great idea put a little gray in his temples i mean that guy, you know what, John? It was you who I was not going to see The Greatest Showman. And because you actually played me some of the soundtrack when we were going to buy some camera equipment one time, I'm like, wow, I really like this. And I I, I found a lone steelbook of The Greatest Showman at Best awesome. Buy. <laughs> and I, I was like, it's a sign. It's because Campia put me onto this. I'm buying this. I loved The Greatest Showman. Loved it. And I was thinking to myself, this guy can do anything. Hugh Jackman, and I've actually interviewed him, and he is one of the most charismatic people I've ever met. And I'm like, my God, uh, the gravitas he could bring to Reed Richards. And, you know, he wouldn't have to get all yoked. And and I, I think I've always thought Reed Richards was like an older guy who had kind of a younger wife and Sue Storm a little bit. You know, maybe my, my parents had a 16-year difference between them. And so I always thought maybe that was the case. So I'm thinking... Hugh Jackman as Reed Richards would be awesome. Awesome. Now, of course, my same caveat that I do with every X actor and X role thing goes along. Who knows? I haven't read the script. I don't know what kind of Reed Richards they're going to try to portray. Uh, but I do know that Hugh Jackman is one of the world's great actors right now, and he could probably do anything. So I, I'd be on board with it. doesn't have to be him. doesn't have to be him. But I admit if they did announce that tomorrow, I'd probably be pretty excited. All right, next up. We've got Dad Jokes, who writes, Stephen Dorff's next movie, Goodfellas 2, scene. Stephen makes a cynical and condescending comment about comic book movies, at which point Giovanni Campia's boys take him out to the back alley where Giovanni beats the living shit out of him with headphones. That could do it. Sign it up. Get a hold of Paramount. Make this movie happen right now. All right, next up, James the Conqueror writes, Mobius says that time flows differently in the TVA. Could it flow backwards? I don't think that's what he was getting at. Uh, that would explain the ring being missing from the end table in episode four. Uh, then the events from No Way Home through Ant-Man Quantumania could be the multiversal war. Love the show. I I mean, it's an interesting theory, James. I And I like the way you're thinking. But I think when Loki asks him the question, Amobia says, it's hard to say time flows differently. If time flowed backwards, that would be an easy answer. Time actually here works backwards. It's just that simple. For him to say it's hard to say because it flows differently, I'm going to guess no, although I do like the way you're thinking about that. And let's keep our eyes on that when we get into the finale because maybe they'll say something along those lines. But for now, and you could be right and I could be wrong, for now I'm going to guess no, but it's, an, it's a really neat theory, James. Well thought out. All right, next up. Um, Tim Tracy writes, one of two. 
Hey, John. Hopefully, Rob, and Rob is here. I've been watching for about two years, throughout which you've both stated that you like James Spader and William Shatner. Well, one of my yes. favorite shows happens to star both of these actors, Boston Legal. It was a spinoff show of The Practice. Fun trivia. In Boston's fourth season, John Larroquette joins the cast. Seeing as you were just talking about him not too long ago, have ed- have you ever seen this show? Ran for five seasons. Love the companionship of Spader and Shatner. Thanks. Well, Tim, all I can say is you must not watch very regularly because I bring up the practice all the time. <laughs> like that, honestly, even more than Sam and Dean Winchester, I have never liked a bro combo, even though the characters weren't literally brothers. I have my favorite bro combo maybe ever in television was James Spader and William Shatner as Denny Crane um, in the practice. Their chemistry together was unbelievable. They won a huge amount of awards. They were just amazing. And Rob, I used to love the way they would end almost all the shows, not all of them, but a bunch of the shows would always end with the two of them sitting in these leather chairs on their rooftop deck of their big building overlooking the city with, you know, some kind of uh, brandy that they'd be sipping and discussing the moral of the story of the show. I ate that relationship up completely ate it up completely absolutely loved it rob what did you think about uh, the practice in james spader and william shatner's chemistry dude okay i mean it was like first of all shatner and spader together was like the ultimate rob burnett fantasy pairing i loved james spader in the 80s i loved him as as the the dickhead and pretty and pink i loved him as rip the, uh, the evil drug dealer in less than zero i loved him in jack's back i especially loved him in sex lies and videotape and of course william shatner my lifelong childhood hero and somebody puts him in a show together where they had all this crazy banter and they were i mean spader was like machiavellian and shatner was this kind of crazy one step away from complete alzheimer's person that was also still a brilliant lawyer and Machiavellian in his own way. I mean, when they would sit outside on the deck and smoke cigars and have banter, I'm like, I'm in heaven, John. Heaven. Yeah, it was it was absolutely fantastic. Love I love that show. All right, next up, BK Dan writes, John, LOL time. You mentioned in a companion video that you read that average American spends $300 a month on alcohol. I have uh, tuned... I have tuned it into a drinking game. Probably meant turned it into a drinking game. Every time you take a drink of Zevia, I take a drink and got to say one of us has got to slow down, LOL. Well, yeah, I mean, listen, you got to understand. The reason I take a drink is because if I don't, my throat wears out very, very quickly. Um, Doing these two-hour shows where you're practically talking nonstop. I mean, thankfully on days like today that I have Rob here, it gives me short breaks, but you watch, you know, even radio guys who do like three hour shows. Yeah. But they take like 12 minute commercial breaks, you know, three or three of them an hour, you know, whatever, like, and me, I'm just constantly talking. So I constantly have to be sipping on something. I just have to, or else I'm just not going to make it. But yes, it is. Uh, you would be getting uh buzz pretty quick. If you try to take a shot of something every time I took a sip. All right, next up. We've got Euro 2020. By the way, Forza Azuri. Anyway, uh, Black Widow opens in Finland on the 7th. That would have been yesterday. I can't make the 60-kilometer bus trip to see it in a theater because bus lines uh, have been reduced due to COVID. Ugh. The 22 euros it costs on Disney Plus will be more than twice uh, as cheap as going to the theater anyway for the bus and everything. For me, easy choice. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the one good thing about this idiotic Disney premium access thing is that there are going to be people right now like yourself who really don't have another option. I mean, most people will, but there are going to be some people that really don't have any other option. And for people like you who are in the circumstances you're in, it's a good thing that that's there because that becomes the only viable option for you right now. And so on that level, it's a good thing. All right. Thanks for sharing that, man. And I hope that gets resolved where you live really, really soon. All right. James Saunders writes, So I may have missed this, but have they explained how there can be so many clearly different types of Lokis? I thought they they show that they can stop all other timelines from happening. So are they the sole survivors of dead prune timelines? Listen, I have said the same thing about this. This show, look, 
I said before, whenever you have a movie or TV show that introduces any kind of time travel, there are always going to be plot holes and logic problems. Always. Even the best of them have them. With the way this show is set up, Loki picks up the Tesseract and disappears, which shouldn't have happened. Instantly, the TVA is there. That's a variance. You're a variant. We got to take you away. Then explain to me if the Tom Hiddleston Loki is the sacred timeline Loki. Explain to me how an alligator Loki was around anything beyond birth. How is a female Loki around anything beyond birth? How is And that's just something that is an inconsistency in the show. And no, they have not explained that yet. So it's an inconsistency. It might have to be one that we just live with. We'll see. But who knows? We still have one episode to go. Maybe they explain it in that final episode. For me, I just accept it and kind of roll with it right now. All right. Next up, James Saunders also writes, Also, if the prime Loki is missing... Do you think that they just reset things and place a Loki back in that spot? Him not being there would have ramifications on the MCU to some form of prime. Loki has to get back to that moment and live out those events. I don't know. And I don't think so. And again, Rob, that's a big inconsistency to me. Like, yeah. Okay. So that's great. You step in and you pull that Loki out, but now you have a moment where Loki isn't there. Like, what does that do? Do you just wipe out all of that existence? It doesn't look like it. I mean, so again, when when you get into this multidimensional time travel stuff, there's always these big logic problems that sometimes Robert feels like they don't even try to address. I don't know if you, if, if, you know, if the pressure was put on you right now, the fire to the feet, how do you explain it right now? Or do you at all? Look, I think that they, there are so many things in play now at the end of, at the end of the show I, I mean, I, I, from what I understand, everybody that's at this void at the end of time are pruned from other timelines, and they've right. set up throughout the show that the, the, the most, the biggest problem in all of creation has been Loki. You know, the various iterations of Loki have been, and even uh, Mobius talks about how many Lokis they've pruned, and it makes sense that for whatever re- reason that the god of mischief. Uh, his, I, I, I like the idea that the, that character is the greatest in all of creation, the biggest problem hmm. because the idea of creating chaos for its own sake, I think is kind of neat because maybe it's that chaos that causes progress. You know, it's, it's those, the chaotic events that he instigates is what has driven the universe to progress. And then maybe ultimately ends i don't know but i i just i like that idea i mean i like the idea that that and and of of all the pruned loki's you know they're all at odds with one another and and they're all i mean i i i I like that i mean i think that idea is kind of cool all right next up we go to anton riley who writes one of two I had a long and kind of lazy weekend. Those are some of the best, my man. Anyway, got my first shot of Pfizer. Good on you, my friend. I got Pfizer as well. On Friday, uh, on Saturday, I got HBO Max for the first time just so I could watch Lovecraft Country. Nice. Binged, uh, watched the 10 episodes in two days, and I can say it's really good. Kind of sad, no season two. What are some shows that you can recommend to me to watch on HBO Max? Oh, God, dude. Uh, I know you and Rob have said a lot of good things about Mayor of Easttown, so maybe I'll check that out. Love the show, dude. Filthy, may you bring. Dude, listen, HBO is the gold standard, and Netflix is doing a very good job. Disney Plus is getting into the game. HBO is the gold standard when it comes to creating the highest quality uh, shows. Like, because you're talking, like, two of the shows that a lot of people will argue are the greatest shows of all time, The Wire. A lot of TV files, Rob, will just say, The Wire, greatest television show ever made. A lot of TV files will point to The Sopranos and say, that, greatest television show ever made. I mean, they've just done some of history's greatest television show. So, I mean, I would say if you got HBO now and you want to get started, start with two of the greatest ever done. Go to The Sopranos, go to The Wire, and watch those things. And when you're watching The Wire, yes, you'll recognize a very, very young Michael B. Jordan running around. Um, But, Rob, put it to you, you know, somebody just picked up HBO Max. What are you recommending they go to watch? Well, 
I would be one of those people that say the wire. But no, I think Mayor of Easttown being new, it's definitely something that's worth worth watching. Um, if you like Stephen King, I thought The Outsider was was pretty good, even though not, it wasn't perfect, but it was beautifully made. Um, you know, the night the night of, I really liked that was a recent HBO uh, series that I enjoyed. And then, of course, you know, um, if you haven't seen it, Oz. Oh, go Oz back is... and watch Oz, dude. Because that show, man, is still hardcore. Oz is great. And by the way, it was really mine, probably a lot of people's first introduction to J.K. Simmons. Yep. Uh, and, oh, Oz. Schillinger, man. What a character he is. But listen, Rob, I just pulled up a list because I forget a lot of these. Listen to some of these titles. Okay, obviously, The Wire, The Sopranos. Laugh at it if you want. It is one of the most culturally relevant and pop culture influential shows that was ever on TV, Sex in the City. It may not be for a lot of us. Right. But don't underestimate that. Game of Thrones, the most decorated award-winning show in history. Uh, Veep, one of the most decorated, celebrated comedies of all time. Curb Your Enthusiasm, Deadwood, uh, The Watchmen, Six Feet Under, uh, Barry. I love Barry. I am so on board with Barry. That thing is great. Uh, the old uh, Bill Paxton show, Big Love. The new euphoria that a lot of people like a lot. Succession, which is winning all types of Emmys all over the place. Uh, Boardwalk Empire. I love Boardwalk Empire. A lot of people are loving Secure right now. Big Little Lies won tons of uh, awards. The cult classic that people seem to love is True Blood. I never watched a lot of that. Chernobyl, which is really more of a mini series, but one of the greatest things I've ever seen on TV was Chernobyl. So you got to make sure that Silicon Valley, Westworld. I mean, this this is just some, some of the things that that are are HBO originals. So yeah, man, you've got yourself a world, a world of content to consume, and uh, and yeah, so go and enjoy, my friend. Go and enjoy. Okay, next up, BK Dan writes, John Dom and Fast Nine has what we in Dungeons and Dragons circles call plot armor. Prove me wrong. Yeah, this kind of resistance to whatever it needs to be resistant to at the time. Uh, he kind of does have that, doesn't he? Uh, by the way, our friend uh, Mukbang Review sends in a, uh, a super chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, Mukbang. I appreciate that. And he says, number one fan. Thank you, dude. I appreciate that very much. Uh, all right. Next up, we've got I'm sexy. Believe me, please. Writes, Hey, John. Kate Shortland, the director of Black Widow, in an interview with Radio Times, when asked about a sequel possibility, said, I think following a different character, yes. John, a Black Widow sequel in current MCU with Yelena as its lead is the logical step. Yes, but don't forget that it was Deadline, I believe, that Kate Shortland was talking to before that. And when Kate Shortland was asked by Deadline, Rob, this is key. When she was asked by Deadline, could there be a sequel, she specifically said, yeah, you can because these girls, plural, still have multiple asses to kick. Hmm. Now, in a subsequent interview, she says, oh, yeah, focusing on a different character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, tinfoil hat crazy theory time. I remember when we read that first quote from her in Deadline and we were like, wait a minute. What What do you mean? What do you mean girls like <laughs> Natasha and Yelena? Like, wait, what did you just tip your hand that? I mean, we all know that Scarlett Johansson is going to be back at some point. It's just like Robert Downey Jr. will just but whatever. Did she just tip her hand? Now, what very well could have happened is once that interview came out, her phone rang and she looked at it. And in the words, Kevin Feige. On her phone. It says, yeah, hey, how about you shut up, Kate? How about you be careful of what you say? Now, again, I don't know that. That's just a tinfoil uh, hat theory. But I don't know, Rob, what do you make of that situation? Do you think do you think she just misspoke in the first interview and just meant Yelena? Or do you think she kind of tipped her hand to say that we could, we're going to see Natasha back again at some point and then was covering her tracks with the second one? If you had to guess which one is the case here, which one do you think it is? Well, I mean, you know, here's the thing. I don't think that when actors are speaking, they're thinking the way we think. You know, they, they're, they're thinking about they have the work done. And uh, uh, when they say things, I think you should necessarily take them at, at face value. I think they were setting up Florence Pugh to be coming back. And, and I think that was probably pretty much understood. 
they can always have Natasha come back. They could make a different, another movie in that same period of time, I suppose. But I, I, I would tend to believe that actors are not necessarily thinking about the teasing a sequel. I mean, I think they're half joking because I think actors, you know, they're, they don't necessarily know or understand. Yeah, remember, this is the director. This is the director we're talking about. R- well, yes, okay, but but th- that too, and you know, I don't. Uh, I mean, obviously, look, she wants to make another movie, and and she was brought in. I was thinking that way because she was brought in by Scarlett Johansson. I mean, yes. Scarlett Johansson did put her up to that task, and so I just think you know, directors, actors, filmmakers. Their position is, yeah, we could always, it'd be great to do another one. You know, they're always like, whatever, but they, they're not thinking in terms of we as fans, like, up oh, the Marvel Undead universe. You know, everybody can come back. Right. So I think everybody, when they make a film, they just say the same kind of thing, like, yeah, it'd be great to do another one. Love the cast and crew, because, you know, when people make movies, they do love their cast and crew, and like, wouldn't we love to get the band back together and make another film? Sure. But I think they're thinking about it in different, in different terms than we as fans would. So we as fans see different things. All right. Next up, we go to Chuck the Mystery who writes, Hey, John and Rob, I watched Steven Soderbergh's No Sudden Move, and I love Mm. it. I I want to watch that. Dude, I'm dying to see that. I can't uh, believe I haven't watched it. Yeah, I just haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Don Cheadle played a role that reminded me of my favorite character he ever played. Mouse in Carl Franklin's brilliant Denzel Washington film, Devil in a Blue Dress. Love that. So good. Thoughts. Listen, I would love to give you my thoughts on No Sudden Move. Rob and I both have talked about this, and we're both dying to see it. I have just not had the opportunity opportunity to sit down and watch it even though it's right there i can just go watch i i just haven't had the opportunity to do it so i have still not seen it but again the cast in that is incredible benicio del toro john ham um uh why am i freezing on brennan frazier is in there too i mean it's just it's a killer cast and i'm dying to see it but rob you haven't had the chance either yet no but i mean i'm a huge steven soderbergh fan and you know even when he made things like high flying bird and unsane that he shot on iPhones. I love that right. stuff too, because you know, he makes movies for adults. And I, I, when I say that, I mean adult material that I always find compelling and I, I watch anything he makes. And this movie looks so good, but I just haven't seen it yet. All right. Next up. We've got Wes Maurer who writes, Hey, John and Rob, Rob might be better to ask this, but I'm sure either of you could point me in the right direction. I'm thinking about starting a dangerous habit in collecting hot toys where online is the best place to order them from. Now, there are, I can tell you, there are a lot of places online you can get. Hell, you can even get them on Amazon. Yeah. I I was actually just looking at a Captain America from Infinity War with the uh, Wakandan shields on his arms, stuff like that. And it was pretty reasonable. It was under 300 bucks. But then I saw a couple of them were like $1,000. But anyway, Rob, you would know, where are the best places? Somebody who wants to buy and look at some hot toys, where are the best places to go to find them? Well, in North America, uh, the the big distributor is Sideshow Toy. Sideshow Toys distributes hot toys here. Um, but if you want to go like closer to, say, Hong Kong when they come out, you can get them from a place called Toys Wonderland. I've bought hot toys at Big Bad Toy Store. You know, there's a lot of, of these bigger box retailer stores, but, but Sideshow does uh, sell them. And, and when you buy hot toys from them, they do give you sideshow reward points that you can later apply to other things, including other hot toys. Um, but yeah, and obviously hot toys are kind of like they, they go, they go up in value. So some of them can be very, very expensive. Yeah. Like I, I was just perusing on Amazon for some, like I said, some of them were up like 800, 900, thousand. One was even like 12. One of the Iron Man ones was like over 1200 bucks. Yeah. It was crazy. All right. Uh, hopefully that just gave you some direction there, Wes and good luck and don't spend too much. All right. Uh, next up, we've got Willow who writes, I disagree with you that releasing the unfinished version of the Snyder cut on onto HBO max would have made everyone happy. I think the fans would have just launched a hashtag finish the Snyder cut campaign, but Hey, at least Warner brothers wouldn't have lost all those millions. You're not wrong about that. You're not wrong about that, that they probably would have started, but guess what happened? Something far worse happened, right? Instead. Now they spent, I mean, the reports are $70 million, but it was more than that. But they spent an additional $70 million. 
did not do anywhere near as well as they hoped it would. Although the results were good. The results yeah. were good. But it didn't perform nearly as well as they hoped. And instead, it just, re instead of satisfying the people who were asking Warner Brothers, hey, come on, give us the Snyder Cut. All it did was infuel them even more. And then it became restore the Snyderverse. And it became people review, organizing and review bombing other Warner Brothers things because they're not bringing back all the Snyder stuff and all that kind of stuff. I propose to you that while I agree with you, that had they just said, okay, look, you guys, I thought what Warner Brothers should have done, and I said this long before they ever announced that they were doing Snyder Cut. I said what they should do is just take the unfinished stuff that they have and put it out on HBO and say, guys, listen, we don't normally do this. It's not good form to put out unfinished product, but you guys have been asking for this. Here you go. This is what it was kind of going to look like and release it for people to see. Now, you're right. They, there would have been some hashtags going around, finish the Snyder Cut. Yep, that probably would have happened. But I would recommend and suggest that it would have been far less damaging and it would have saved them $70 million. And I just think it would have been a lot less negative repercussions than what they got by putting it out in the first place, which again goes to prove the old adage, no good deed goes unpunished. But uh, I still think to this day it would have been the better thing because I think there would have been less negative repercussions. I mean, the unfortunate part is we wouldn't have gotten the higher quality version of of, of the uh, Justice League come out. That would have been one of the drawbacks. But I think what they suffered as a result of putting that out would have been much, much, much smaller had they just put out the unfinished version. Now, Rob, I remember you and I were having discussions about that. Like, uh, you know, a few months before they announced that they were going to complete the Snyder Cut thing, which was an incomplete thing up until that time. And you were very much on the side of that they should complete it. I was kind of on the side of just take it and release it so people can see it. But in hindsight now, now that it's all kind of behind us and it's all in the rear view mirror and everybody's moved on, was it the right move to spend the money and finish it? Would they have gotten worse repercussions had they just released it? On, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that right now? I, I, I think they absolutely, if, if you're going to do it, do it. If you're going to do it, finish it. Do it the right way. No filmmaker, no actor, no one who ever works on a movie wants an unfinished film released because it doesn't show anybody's work in their best light. And people that aren't in the film business, and let's face it, even a lot of people in the film business aren't able to look at an unfinished movie and understand what they're looking for. They're just like, they'll, they'll ask you, well, why didn't you finish it? So it'll never get judged on its own merits. It'll always be looked at as something that was never, never finished. So I think, look, kudos to everyone who's going, who went all in to make sure that the Snyder Cut reached us. I think it was a triumph for fandom, a triumph for Zack Snyder, a triumph for everybody that worked on that movie. And I think it will stand the test of time. And it'll be around for decades to come as what it is. And I think that's a great thing for everyone. And we're getting a Hot Toys two pack out of it, so good on us. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I just think today, if you really asked honestly, I think they regret doing it. I think Warner Brothers regrets doing it right now. But who knows? We'll see. But again, we did get a better version of the movie that comes out of it. All right, next up, uh, we've got Emily who writes. Just leaving this tip in honor of your epic Stephen Dorff takedown on Tuesday on Tuesday's live stream. Thank you, Emily. I appreciate that very much. And I, again, I won't go into the Stephen Dorff thing again. All right, Dad Jokes writes, John, you mentioned that you have not seen a movie involving time travel where the travelers could only travel back a specific amount of time from the present. It actually was done in a pretty good 2006 movie called Deja. Well, that's the Denzel Washington movie, Deja Vu, starring Den Denzel Washington. Uh, yeah, but I don't think, Rob, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think that worked the way that time travel worked in Tomorrow War. Because in right. Tomorrow War, there was a fixed point in the future that moved forward in regular time and a point in the past that moved at the same rate through time. And at all times, you could only jump back and forth between those two points as they collectively moved through time that way. I don't recall ever seeing that. And I, I, if, I might be wrong, but I don't think that's the way it worked in De Deja Vu. Do you remember that? Yeah, I don't think it worked like that in Deja Vu either. Um, but again, I, it's funny. I own Deja Vu, and I don't quite <laughs> remember the time travel mechanism in it. It's something I, I will need to rectify so I remember how it all worked. Yeah, I might have to go back and check that out to see if that's how it worked. But anyway, thanks for putting that on our radar, Dad Jokes. All right, Arnie Asada writes, 
Last movie I saw in theaters before the pandemic shut down was the horrible Vin Diesel movie Bloodshot. Oh, thanks a lot, man. I thought I had put that out of my mind. I had forgotten about Bloodshot, but now it's back in. Anyway, only fitting that my first movie back should be the horrible Vin Diesel movie F9. Now I associate the pandemic with Vinny D. I call it the Vindemic. <laughs> I because that was one of the last things that 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 got put out just before, as the pandemic was hitting was bloodshot and again i am a huge vin diesel fan i love that guy i'll watch anything he puts out i was not happy with bloodshot i don't think many people were happy with bloodshot but it is funny the way you put that the first, last one i saw was bloodshot and the first one i saw back was f9 to you it is the vindemic all right that's interesting well put arnie well put all right next up uh don't forget rewind john writes john while funny, if you keep dropping F-bombs like you did on Dorf, YouTube will start pulling your videos and demonetizing you. Be careful. No, that's not the way YouTube works. Um, look, if you do it too excessively, they may demonetize one that one specific video. But it, the way YouTube works is they won't go around like if I drop like 25 F-bombs in one video, which I try not to do most of the time. But if I did, the worst thing that could happen is they might de demonetize that one video. They won't demonetize other videos as a result of that. So it's really not something I worry about. Plus, they've gotten a lot more. Uh, YouTube has changed policies lately that they they're a lot more flexible on just like language that's used as long as it's not hate language and things like that. But. There are a lot more lenient on that these days, so it's not really a big uh, a big concern right now. By the way, Richard Hearn sends in a super chat badge in the live chat saying, good job. Thank you, Richard. I appreciate that, man. All right. Next up, we've got uh, Anton Riley writes, I just saw the video that Chris Stuckman is directing an indie horror movie, and it sounds like he won't be doing movie reviews anymore, but doing something else with the channel in the future. Uh, proud the dude is getting his opportunity and wish him the best. Yeah, listen, obviously you guys know I know Chris, and uh, Chris has been on my panel at Comic-Con. He's come and done videos with me. Uh, I've, uh, I've gotten a chance to get to know Chris a little bit. And Rob, that, that news came out that Chris, I, I, I'm i assuming you saw the news that Chris. Oh, was yes. I be, tweeted about it as soon as it dropped. Going to be directing a little film. Now, listen, I, I confess that I had never heard of this company that he's doing it with. And they don't have any. It's called Paper Something. And I remember when I went and looked them up. I know they have no social media presence. They have like under a thousand social media followers. So I don't know anything about the company that he's doing it with. And I watched Chris's video, and I have obviously not talked to Chris Stuckman about any of this, but I was I was a little saddened to hear, because listen, Chris is like one of the best guys out there at just straight up reviews. When it comes yep. to straight up reviews, you know, I always say that the job of a reviewer is not to say what's popular and not to try to convince you to agree with them. The job of a reviewer is to express what they thought in such a way that it helps you sharpen what you thought, whether it's the opposite thing that they believe or the same thing that they believe. And Chris has always been one of the best guys at doing that. You know, you, you look at the two prominent straight up reviewers on YouTube are probably Jeremy and, and Chris, and they're polar opposites of each other, of each other. One does it very entertaining. One goes a little bit more in depth. Right. And I've always considered Chris to be like really one of the best guys out there as a straight up reviewer with my interpretation and definition of what a good reviewer does. He's really good at that. And so knowing that he's so good at that, I'm not going to lie. I was a little saddened as a fan of his, to hear him say he doesn't even like doing it. He doesn't even like doing movie reviews. And I, I, I'm not going to lie, I was a little saddened to hear that, especially cons considering he's so good at it. That I think a lot of people would wish and dream they could be as good at doing straight-up reviews as he is. That said, I think most people in this industry um would be lying if they didn't say that what they'd really like to do is make movies. Now, I was in a situation like Chris's, and Rob, you know about this one. I was in a situation like Chris's a number of years ago where I had an opportunity through a small company that I never really heard about to direct and make a film, and I just decided that I didn't think it would, because of who and what the company was, I didn't think it would be good for me, and so I actually took a pass on that because I thought it would have been a disaster, and I focused that if I did want to make something, I'm just going to do it myself. That's my approach. But 
I think with Chris's analytical mind, I think he'll do well. I, I, again, my only fear is the company he's doing it with. Cause I know so little about them, but Chris's analytical mind and the way he thinks and the way he processes, I think he can do very well in something like this. And I hope for great success for him. I hope that this company that again, I'd never heard of, I hope they don't hold him back. That's the only thing I'm a little bit nervous about is that he gets that he's the right guy, but he gets involved with the wrong people. And I just don't know anything about these people. I hope they don't hold him back. But anyway, I, I it's tremendously exciting get to, getting to see a guy do something like that. There's another guy uh, named Ryan who was big in the horror circles, a guy all of us in our industry knows. And he was really big in the horror circles and online punditry. And guess what he does now? He's a big executive at uh, Blumhouse. He's a huge executive, Ryan Turek. He was a big, big, big in all the horror movie websites and stuff like that. And he got to make that transition. And now he's one of the most important execs at Blumhouse. And that's great. And I hope that Chris Stuckman can be that next big success story. And I hope it goes well for him. But anyway, Rob, you saw that Chris uh, is going to be directing a small indie horror film, which is exactly what he wants to do. And by the way, the exact kind of movie that a first time director like Chris should be cutting his teeth on. So he's already doing it the right way. What are your thoughts on it? Well, look, I too, like you, I'm a huge Chris Stuckman fan. I enjoy getting Stuckmanized with his reviews. You know, I, I think he's got a keen mind, a real great understanding of 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 storytelling. And I, I've enjoyed, and he always has hot toys figures in the background, which he moves around depending on what, it, what he's reviewing. And I appreciate that small detail. But I, I've always liked his reviews. But here's the thing. I mean, you know, there's only so long you can talk about other people's work, I think, before you want to do something on your own. And he's always wanted to make films. He's talked about making short films. And he's never been shy or bashful about admitting that. And now he's getting a shot. You know, and and I think he'll, he's, you, you know, you keep the channel. Like, look, John, you know, I think we both have made movies, yet we still keep our, our YouTube punditry going. Um, I started my own YouTube career with you in April of 2015, where I'm now on year six of it. And during that time, I've always managed to keep another foot in, in the professional world making stuff, whatever it might be. And uh, I, I like having that balance because being on YouTube fuels my interest and desire uh, to participate in the industry, but it also keeps me abreast of what's going on in the industry. And I think that there's something to be said for both of it, both of these things. But Chris is getting an opportunity. He's getting a shot. And when you make a movie, you got to go all in. You know, if, if I got uh, the chance to produce another film, I would probably have to take a leave of absence from YouTube because it requires all of your attention and focus to make what you're doing great. And so I think for him, it's a great opportunity. We'll see where it goes, you know, and it's going to be a journey. I, I can't wait to hear him talk about and share. And maybe he will do that, figuring out a way to share with his audience what it's like to go through and to achieve this dream of making your fil first film. Um, so I, I'm happy for him. And I think that I, the world is going to finally get to see something that he makes and hopefully it's very successful for him. But I look forward to the fact that he does have a YouTube platform and he will, he's got almost a million subscribers, I think. Over. And being able to share that story of his journey, uh, is going to be, I think, exciting. And I look forward to hearing it. I really wish that in his announcement, two things didn't happen. I wish he didn't say he wasn't going to be doing reviews anymore. Cause like I said, I think he's one of the better guys on the internet. Yeah, when it too. comes to, to the true standard of a film reviewer, I just think he's one of the best who's done it on this platform ever. Um, so it's, it's disappointing to hear that. I wish he hadn't in his video though, revealed that he doesn't even like doing movie reviews. I wish he hadn't done that because now if heaven forbid, like the, the directing thing doesn't take off. It's going to be, it might feel a little awkward watching his review. If he goes back to doing movie reviews two years from now, it'll be a little bit awkward for me knowing this guy doesn't even like doing what he's doing. I don't know. I just wish he hadn't said that one part, uh, mm. but maybe I'm just more bummed out that we're not going to get more Chris Stuckman reviews. So that's probably the thing about, but listen, it's going to be awesome to see how he progresses. It's going to be awesome to see how this movie comes together. I hope again, I hope this company that he's working with does not hold him down or hold him back. Um, Cause I think he's got a really good mind for something like this. And if anybody in this sphere um, is positioned to do well, I think it's him. 
So uh, let's keep watching it in the worlds of Palpatine. Let's watch his career with great interest and see how that goes. Um, all right, Rob, on that note, I know we've kept you a little bit over time here. Thanks for being here, man. In the meantime, where can people follow you and your adventures online? Well, you can find me on Instagram at Robert Meyer Burnett. Find me on Twitter at Burnett RM or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. All right, dude. Thanks a lot for being here. Great job again today. And I will talk to you later, my friend. Have a good one. All right, sir. Talk to you later. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and the only Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. All right, guys, we still have a little bit of time here, so let's keep on going through your questions, shall we? Next up, we're going to go to Alex Detman, who writes, John, I went 0 for 3 in my questions last week. I'm not sure what that means. I'm sure all your questions were good. Um, so I'll keep uh, it simple, stupid this week. Is it true that they are currently filming another Predator? No. As far as I know, they're not, unless I'm forgetting something. No. Uh, if so, do you know the details? Because I love Predator, and I wish they would pick up after Predators. Um, yeah, the last Predator movie th that Shane Black did was so disappointing. I was so excited for that Predator movie because I love Shane Black. Shane Black is a terrific writer, terrific director. I love his movies, and I was really exciting to see how that goes. And then the movie turned out, in my opinion, to be actually quite bad. It was really unfortunate. Now, I know that Disney Plus is currently, at least they're lining up to do a, an Alien series. Whether that's going to be on their FX brand or their Hulu brand or on Disney Plus, I can't remember. But they are doing a new Alien series. But as far as I know, I could be wrong, but as far as I know, there is not another Predator movie shooting. And when and if they ever go back to the Predator... Not really sure. We'll have to find out. All right. Next up. Thanks for that, Alex. Next up, we got Daniel James Cole who writes, just rewatched Loki. Uh, and uh, is it just me or do they still need to tie up what happened with all the time charges that Sylvie set off at the end of episode two? Did I miss something? Well, listen, you're not the first person to ask that, Daniel, but here's the simple answer. They were nothing but a distraction. The time charges that Sylvie sent out. Remember, once she sent those through, all the time portals, what happened? All the Minutemen of the TVA instantly rushed out to take care of those situations. The whole thing about those charges was to do nothing except cause a distraction to get as many Minutemen out of the TVA as possible so she could then sneak into the TVA and go and take care of the timekeeper. So all it was was a distraction, so there was really no more explanation needed beyond that. Anyway, thanks for asking, Daniel. Next up. Matt Bailey writes, I've been confused since the second episode. <laughs> Loki says Sylvie has been hiding in apocalypses, yet some of the scenes, 1985 uh, Oshkosh, 1858 Oklahoma, and 1549 France aren't apocalypses, what gives? Okay, I think somebody else once asked a similar question. Here's the thing, Matt. Those aren't apocalypses. They're not meant to be. But the thing is, Sylvie wasn't hiding in 1985 Oshkosh or 1858 Oklahoma or 1549 France. She wasn't hiding there. She went to those times and places because her presence did cause a nexus event because she was laying a trap for Minutemen. She was trying to lure Minutemen in Oshkosh and Oklahoma and France to come there so she could ambush them, murder them, and take their time charges and their temp pads. So that was the point. And then once she murdered them and got what she wanted, she would then go back to one of the apocalypse events so she could hide. So that's uh, that's the explanation for that. Thanks for writing that in, Matt. All right, next up. Kevin, not Kevin Feige writes, Kang is not an alien, though. Well, he's a descendant of Richard's. Anyway, there's a lot of different variations of Kang, but yeah, that's generally true. All right, next up. An anonymous viewer writes, uh, sadly, Richard Donner passed away. This was, of course, the other day. Uh, and I was thinking all of his movies from Superman and Lethal Weapon. How do you rank? I don't do rankings, just so you know, generally speaking. Uh, how do you rank uh, Richard Donner films? Mine is uh, Superman, Superman 2, The Director's Cut, Goonies, Lethal Weapon franchise, 5, uh, Omen. What is your list? Bring on the filthy. Again, I don't do the I, I don't do off the spot lists and things like that. I, I would include in there somewhere Lady Hawk. <laughs> I love Lady Hawk. Um but yeah, unfortunately, when everybody thinks of Richard Donner, of course, they just think of Superman. And, and again, that's understandable because Superman was so pivotal and such an important film. It was such an important film, but they forget about things like Lethal Weapon and Goonies and, of course, Lady Hawk. So, yeah, there's that. And it was a, a tremendous loss. But what a what a Valhalla kind of career that that dude had, man. What a Valhalla kind of career. All right. Next up, Sir William Williams handwrites. 
It seemed like in the last episode that Renslayer was hiding Mobius from Sylvie. Could it be that Sylvie would recognize Mobius uh, from her life as a child as Thor or even Odin? Nah, a lot of people still speculating even today going into the final episodes that Mobius is himself a Loki variant. I personally think there's been enough evidence there to prove that that's not the case, so I don't think so. All right, next up, Michael Antonucci writes, John. I do not want to write a question. I sent you an email, but you never wrote back. Okay, so let me just stop you there for a second, Michael. I read, just so you guys know, I read every email I get. I do. But I literally get one to 200 things coming to my inbox every day. I clearly cannot respond. Once in a while, I will, but it, it's because I just don't have the time. I would literally take up one to two to three hours of my day every day just to respond to emails. And I, I, I can't do that. But do understand that I read every email that comes through. Okay, that said, uh, let's get back to it here. You never wrote back, so I just wanted to thank you and Rob for helping me out of the pandemic. I have uh, I have had bad anxiety. Uh, bad was out of work for medical leave for over a year due to COVID and watching... Uh, to continue my message, watching the show every day helped me a lot. Uh, and we all let our frustration of no content for a year together. So again, thank you, Job, John and Rob as well. And I think that's the end of that. Yeah. Let's, hey, Michael, listen, one of the great things we talk about this all the time. One of the great things about movies and storytelling, particularly on the screen, that is so great is that it's not just an escape. It's an oasis. An escape is, is something you duck around a corner and hide for a minute and then you come out and you're right back in the same situation. Stories being told on the screen are more than that. They're a place that we, yes, go into, but while we're there, we're refreshed. Our minds, our spirits, our souls, whatever, rest. We're given new perspectives on life. We're given new ways to look at the world around us. Maybe we become inspired or whatever. I know for me, when I go into a movie, when I'm in a bad place or in a bad time in my life, when I go into a really good movie, when I come out, not only do I feel a little bit more capable of dealing with the real world issues, but maybe I've been inspired to look at it differently or I have fresh perspectives or whatever. And that's great. And then also the film fan community, all of us as fans together talking about our shared love of these things does that as well. And that's one of the reasons why I love the movies and storytelling so much. And I'm super glad that we and, and them overall have been there for you, Michael, during what has been a very, very challenging time for all of us. So thanks for sharing your thoughts on that, Michael. And I'm glad you came out the other side. All right, next up, we've got uh, uh, Kamada writes, one of three. Hey, John and Rob, just missed Rob. Uh, love your show and fellow Canadian. Thank you for writing in my fellow Canadian. I just wanted to say we found a new house and are moving in a month. That's awesome. Got any advice for your first big move? Yeah. Get movers. Don't do it yourself. Don't get friends to do it. It costs a little bit of money, but it's worth every penny. Get movers. Don't do it yourself. Um, now into movies, my friend and I, after two years got to go, got to see each other again in person. Uh, to hang out and talk slash watch Marvel shows we've been meaning to enjoy together. We want to watch Black Widow in the movie theaters when theaters reopen, uh, but what won't? But that won't be for another few weeks. In the meantime, I've been watching Manifest, as others have been talking about it, and I enjoy it. But like Kim's convenience, I'm bummed that we won't uh, get to likely see future seasons. Also, I now understand why you love John Wick Chapter 3. Oh my God, the movie is special, especially the dogs wrecking fools. Well, first of all, that is awesome that you and your friends are able to get back together again now and actually start watching the movies and shows that you've been wanting to watch. I will say this, though, about Manifest. I tapped out on Manifest after about two or three episodes. I couldn't take it. I'm not going to lie. I thought it was terrible myself. Uh, Rob kept watching it, but he always describes it as hate watching. <laughs> like he hates it, but he keeps watching it. So he called, he would define watching manifest as hate watching. So he watched it all the way through. Obviously I can't comment on manifest past the first three episodes or so. Cause I gave up on it after that. Um, so I can't say, but the important thing here is that you enjoyed it. And listen, I've heard there is talks that it could be picked up by Netflix or somebody else. So keep hope alive. If you're enjoying that show, keep hope alive. It may, may still come back. I'm not saying for sure it will, but 
maybe it will. All right, next up. Uh, Dorf Eat My Shorts writes, I never liked Stephen Dorf. I always thought he was an asshole. Well, now I know he's an asshole. I bet Scarlet made more for Black Widow than he's made his entire career combined. He's just jealous because he can't make that kind of cheddar. I, I, Again, to me, it's not about the money that gets made. To, to me, the thing that was, that was really surprising is he talks about how he's so much better than everybody else that he waits to be in good films like Uva Bowl movies. And you want me to bring up your filmography and the fact that he seems to think he's so much better than Anthony Hopkins and he's too good for Robert Redford and he's too good for Ben Kingsley and he's too good for Kate Blanchett and he's too good for all these Academy level actors who are by far his superior that have done these things and had fun with us and got the, the love of the fans and all that kind of stuff. But for him, it's an embarrassment. You're embarrassing. Yeah, Ben Affleck's an Academy Award winning filmmaker, but he's an embarrassment for being Batman. I, I just, it, yeah, again, I'm not going to go into it again. I'm, I moved past it. Uh, Steven Dorff is not worth the breath that, that, I, that I takes me to breathe in order to talk about him. So we'll just move on. Anyway, Alan writes, uh, hey, John, after seeing Dragon, maybe uh, Fin Fang Foom in Shang-Chi trailer, it got me thinking. If they could make it work and look good in Shang-Chi, why couldn't Disney do the same for Mushu and Mulan live action movies? Seems like it was possible. Well, of course it was possible. Them not putting Mushu into Mulan had nothing to do with, oh, we don't know how to make a CGI dragon. Well, of course they did. Obviously they could have. It was a story decision. And I'm not going to lie to you. I think it was the right decision. I know that's the unpopular thing to say. Everybody's screaming at me through their computer monitors right now. I get it, but I don't care. I, I, I stand with them on that. Look, and Mulan wasn't great. I enjoyed Mulan. I, I thought Mulan was good, but it, it certainly wasn't great, and it could have been better, but I don't think adding Mushu was going to make it. I think for the style of movie they were going for and the story they were trying to tell there, I I actually think they made the right decision. I, I don't care if you hate that I that I say that, but it, I honestly do. I honestly think they made the right decision. I also think they made several wrong decisions. That movie should have been a lot better. That movie looked great, by the way. It looked awesome. But uh, yeah, they made a lot of mistakes in that movie. They did. But I don't think leaving the dragon out was one of them. I, it's just, just kind of my take on it. All right, next up. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Wes Maurer writes, okay, John, uh, boss logic teased another Wolverine picture. Only this time the caption said soon what's going on there. I don't know, but boss logic is not a Disney employee. He doesn't work for Kevin Feige. So, I mean, boss logic is a fan is boss. Logic is a pure treasure of the fandom community. I love his work. He's amazing. Um, but you know, he doesn't work for Kevin Feige. So, I mean, it could mean soon anything, but I wouldn't look, I wouldn't read into it personally. All right. DJ Taterskins, by the way, sends in a super chat badge in the live chat. Thank you, DJ. Appreciate that, man. All right. Next up. Francis writes, Hey, John, Grace Randolph tweeted today that she has news of Charlie Cox in Spider-Man and also in the She-Hulk series, not only appearing as Matt Murdock, but as Daredevil as well. Over under 50%. This is true. Listen, I, I don't care what any, I'm not here to comment on the words, thoughts, or opinions of other YouTubers. That is not what I'm here to do. That's, nothing. So I, while I appreciate you writing that in, I'm going to respectfully take a pass on that because that's not what I'm here to do, but I appreciate you asking. I know you don't, I know you weren't asking out of any maliciousness or anything like that, but I'm not here to talk about other people, what things other people are saying. That's, that's not what I'm here to talk about. All right. Ryan Loner writes, the original novel, 101 Dalmatians, had a completely insane sequel where the entire human race falls into comas and telepathic dogs take over the world. I've never heard of that. I don't even know if that, I don't know if that's true or not, but I've never heard of that. Anyway, I'm pretty sure Disney's never going there, but aren't you happy that you know about it? Again, I don't know that that's true. Uh, it is a totally wild, wild thing to hear if it is true, but I've never even heard of such a thing, Ryan. Thanks for putting it on my radar though. All right. USCMC M56 Smart Gunner writes, Hey, John and company. Uh, real men watch my girl one and two and cry and are proud of it. Uh, also, have you seen judgment night? Oh yeah. That was the one with, um, um, oh crap. The guy who played, uh, the girl's dad, she, he played Emma stone's dad in Spider-Man. Why am I forgetting his name? 
he sang the song I'm an asshole is the song he sang and I'm forgetting his name anyway uh, have you seen Judgment Night 1993 starring Emilio Estevez and Cuba Gooding Jr great movie everyone should check it out thanks for everything thanks yeah I like Judgment Night but why am I freezing on the guy's name Dennis Leary thank you Jesse uh, Swarbick uh, Wild Man and Beyond, Maximus Prime, Yellow Flash. Thank you. I don't know why I was freezing on Dennis Leary's uh, name on that. Yes, Dennis Leary. I like Dennis Leary. I don't care what anybody says. I like Dennis Leary. Um, yeah, it, good movie. I like Judgment Night. And that RV thing. I, I mean, if I just remember, it's been a long time since I've seen it. But uh, yeah, I dig that movie very much. All right, next up. Uh, we've got Mr. Downtown Rights, one of three. Hey, John and gang, this is my first ever submission, so be gentle. Well, thank Appreciate it. Good to have you here. FX just released a sizzle reel video of upcoming TV shows this fall. One of my favorite graphic novels is Why the Last Man finally got teased in a video. I did see that the other day. Uh, getting the show launched has been the definition to Murphy's Law, from changing showrunners to Barry Keoghan dropping out as the star Yorick. With all these pitfalls by FX, should I even get invested or should I just re reread the novel? Uh, shoot, maybe hope that HBO and AMC get the rights. Uh, many thanks. As you made it easier to deal with the pandemic, please always bring the filthy. Well, listen, I will say this. First of all, why the, the drama behind why the last man goes well even before effects. Remember, for a long time, Shia LaBeouf was supposed to star in a movie version of it. Um, and hold a second. Uh, let me let me bring this up so I can get the, the name of the director again. Uh, and so Shia LaBeouf was set to star in it and DJ Caruso was set to direct it. Now, DJ Caruso and Shia LaBeouf teamed up to make that little movie Eagle Eye. By the way, not a bad little movie. Eagle Eye wasn't a bad little movie. I, I kind of liked it. Um, of course, he also directed things like uh, I Am Number 4, Disturbia, things like that. So he, he and Shia LaBeouf were set for a couple of years to do the why the last man and it just got caught up in development hell and development hell and development hell and then finally it died and went away and then the idea came of it becoming a television show listen i have all the faith in the world in fx all the faith in the world in fx they made to me one of the greatest television shows of all time in um in sons of anarchy sons of anarchy is one of my top three favorite shows of all time and they have got a plethora of of other good shows like fantastic. So listen, them having to me, why the last man is in good hands. Have they had some turbulence on the way to production? Yeah. A lot of things do Well, you, but that isn't normal for effects where you, when you start to get normals, when it's a studio that is constantly having, you know, four or five directors going through a project, three or four stars going through five or six sets of writers. And that happens like with every single one of their projects. That is not the case here with effects. That's just not the case. So if you're looking forward to why the last man, which I am, then I think you got to breathe a deep, deep, deep cleansing breath and be grateful that effects is doing it. Now, look, there are like, HBO, if they were doing it, that would be fantastic too, obviously. But I think with effects, they're in very, very good hands. Um, so, so rest assured, Mr. Downton, rest assured. All right, next up, we've got Lord Genome writes, I got to say, Loki is really dropping the ball. I've seen people defend episode five for all the comic references, but that's supposed to be icing on the proverbial cake. I agree with that. Uh, not a major draw. Plus, to someone who doesn't read the comics, there's no thematic impact. Yeah, look, I, I'm not gonna, I overall like Loki very much. But out of the five episodes we've seen, I've been disappointed in two of them. I thought three was a bad episode. It was a bad episode. I thought, I didn't think five was bad, but I thought it was disappointing. Now, it was disappointing, but it also had some big highlights. That Loki self-actualization scene saying, I've betrayed everybody that's loved me. My brother, my father. I mean, that was a terrific moment. Richard E. Grant's glorious purpose. <laughs> that was awesome. That scene was great. And yeah, I love the little Easter eggs. The Thor helicopter, uh, sorry, the, the Thanos helicopter, Frog Thor, uh, the dark, uh, 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 Ronan, the accuser ship. I keep for the name the, the living tribunals head, like all the little Easter eggs were fantastic, but you're right. 
dropping in Easter eggs does not make an episode a good episode. That should just be fun little icing on the cake. I love the way you put that. So um, it had great moments, some highlight moments. I enjoyed all the Easter eggs. But yeah, listen, I'm not going to give a final judgment until we have the whole series, until we, after we see episode six. But if I had to today rank the MCU Disney Plus shows, it would be WandaVision, Falcon, Winter Soldier, Loki. And I'm, I'm still enjoying, like, I like Loki. I'm, I'm liking the show overall. I am. I'm having a really good time with it. But yeah, I agree. I think uh, they've dropped the ball a couple of times, but I believe they are going to bring it home. I believe we're going to have a killer finale. At least they better. Um, I think they're going to have a gangbusters finale, even though they've got too much. They should have introduced the villain in, in, in the last, not bringing the actual person behind everything until the very last minute, I think is a mistake, but whatever it's, uh, I think they're going to do a good job and let's keep our fingers crossed. All right. Next up, uh, Lord genome writes, I got to say, Oh, sorry. That was Lord genome. Uh, next up we've got Alvin J. Elmore who writes, with today's movie technology, I think Hollywood can now successfully finish Bruce Lee's original vision for Game of Death. I really don't like bringing people back from the dead in new movies, but I think this would be a good exception. Hashtag re release the Bruce Lee cut. I Listen, Alvin, I can totally see why you're saying that, and I can appreciate the sentiment. I got to say I disagree. I, I do not see the need to digitally recreate Bruce Lee. I'd say just let it go. Uh, yeah, that I, I, I'm, yeah, I think it's, it, it's just got to let that go. I mean, that's my opinion, but listen, I'm sure you're not alone, Alvin. I'm sure there'd be a bunch of people that would be excited to hear something like that. For me, it's, it's going to be a hard pass though. It would be a hard pass for me. All right. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on it though, Alvin. All right. Tron writes, uh, top five worst of 2021 so far five without remorse. Yeah. I didn't like that. Number four, mortal Kombat. I wasn't a huge fan of the Mortal Kombat movie. Uh, number three, Spiral. Yeah. Number two, Cherry. Yeah. Number one, Tom uh, uh, Tom and Jerry. Honorable mention, uh, Little Things, Boring, Coming to America, Extremely Disappointed. Any of these stand out to you? I void voided Thunder Force, by the way. Well, I was going to say until you wrote that last, that line there. Dude, where's Thunder Force? <laughs> Why is Thunder Force? Thunder Force, I mean, without hyperbole or exaggeration, it really is one of the worst films I've ever seen. Thunder Force is one of the worst movies I have ever seen. But yes, Tom and Jerry was bad. Cherry, I mean, everybody was all excited about the Russos and stuff, but Cherry was bad. Um, without remorse, prrr, was disappointing. I mean, yeah, there have been some bad ones. Every year there will be. Every year there will be, of course. But yeah, Thunder Force, I, I mean, do yourself a, tra uh, a favor, Tron, and just leave that one on your unwatched list. That in Fast 9. Fast 9 has got to rank right up there too. Not as bad as Thunder Force. Nowhere, uh, yeah, nowhere near as bad as Thunder Force. But F9 is completely terrible too. That's just my opinion. Some people are loving F9 and that's awesome. I don't mean to yuck on anybody's yum, but for me personally, I thought F9 was a big disappointment. And again, I'm a big fast and furious fan and I did not like nine at all, but anyway, thunder force avoid it at all costs. All right. Uh, last one today, guys, we've got anonymous who writes, a few years ago, people floated the idea of a Giancarlo Esposito as the new Magneto. I remember that. Yeah. A victim of the Rwandan genocide. Do you think Marvel would be better off using a black American as Magneto, considering the plight of black Americans throughout history? So, no, because, listen, there have the thing about Magneto is that when you go back to the, like, the original thing of Magneto, right? Magneto as a kid got to see humanity at its absolute most brutal heartlessness and evil being a part of the concentration camps, right? That's the thing. It was a pivotal moment that made Magneto just not think as a kid, oh, some people are bad, but think that the human race is rotten. You have to have something that is literally on that level. And so I don't think, I think they would be better served 
for something like the Rwandan genocide, where it looks like the whole, if you were living in that situation, by the way, Don Cheadle has a terrific movie about that, those whole events called uh, Hotel Rwanda that Don Cheadle was nominated for an Academy Award for. It's the best performance of his career. If you've never seen Hotel Rwanda, go watch it. But a situation that would, if you were living in it, thinking that the whole stinking human race is awful. The whole human race sucks. Things like the Rwandan genocide, there have been some terrible like uh, atrocities in Europe as well. I think you have to go with one of those. I think you have to go with one of those. And so that's why, like when the idea of a Giancarlo, uh, Giancarlo Esposito playing Magneto came up saying, you say that coming out of the Rwandan genocide. Now, of course, some people say, why not just stick with the original one? Because too much time has passed. Now we would be having a 90-year-old Magneto. And some people say, well, just say Magneto ages slower. That has never been one of the powers of Magneto. So no, please don't do that. But the reality is, if you want to tell a Magneto story today that is true to the spirit of the Magneto character, then you need to update the background story. If you want to stay true to the character, you need to update the background story. Because the the concentration camps is now too far in our history. It has to be something that a character like Magneto could have realistically lived through. And that's why I think something like the Rwandan genocide or something along those lines would serve that really well. Uh, it's not the only thing they can do. There, there are other options. There are other options. That's just why I think that is a good example of something that I think would work. Uh, not a hundred percent, but it could work. All right. Um, uh, yes. Anyway, guys, that will do it for today's installment of the John Campy show. Now, listen, there are still more questions to come. So we're going to do a companion video today. I was going to do one yesterday, but I just, I was feeling rotten. I had a hard enough time getting through the Loki spoiler discussion. So I, I just couldn't do it, but I feel great today. So a little bit later today, we're going to be doing a companion video. We're going to pick things up here with James LH, Jerome, uh, Scott Brown, Kylo Ken and others. Do not worry. You send in those questions. We're going to get to them in a companion video a little bit later today. Guys, thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to watch along with us today. Special thanks to Robert Meyer Burnett for bringing his glory and goodness. And a very special thank you to all of you guys who sent in the live questions. By the way, we got some super chat badges that got sent in here. Uh, the last most recent one was from what pisses me off. I love that username sends in a super chat badge. Thanks, man. So thank you to all of you guys who sent in these live comments and questions. Number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did it. And all of us involved with the John Campia Show, thank you guys so much for your support. All right, guys, don't forget the John Campia Show. We'll be back again on Monday. Look for our companion video a little bit later today. Maybe it'll pop up tomorrow on Saturday, but it's coming probably today. Keep your guys' eyes open for that. That'll do it for now, guys. My name's John Campia. And until next time, my friends... Bye-bye.